Well, it is so great to see you here today. It looks like it's still a a beautiful day out there, and uh, so I hope you're enjoying uh, this day, this first day of the week. We actually celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. That's why we're here on Sundays. Uh, But today happens to be a special Sunday other than that, and it's Father's Day. And so I want to invite all of the fathers, if you would just stand, just stand right where you are if you're a father here today. Maybe you don't have any biological children, but you've led somebody to the Lord, encourage you to stand as a father to someone spiritually. Let's give these guys a round of applause. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, Special guys here. And so we appreciate your leadership and your encouragement uh, to our congregation here today. Um, I want to uh, give you an update on uh, things going on around the church here. Uh, First of all, you saw the VBS slideshow. It was a fantastic week. Uh, I think uh, there were, um, well, one one day we had uh, 273 children. I think it was on Wednesday and, and 145 uh, workers, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, so there were just all kinds of people all over the place, as you saw in the pictures there. So it was a wonderful, wonderful week. And uh, so we thank you for your support for that. Sitting right here in the pews you, you're sitting in now, these kids are just praising the Lord and singing and, and uh, doing the motions to the songs and all of that. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, also, I see uh, Marty standing over here. Marty shared with me uh, just a, a minute ago that he has a granddaughter. He just wanted to share a praise with everybody. His granddaughter's been healed uh, from her allergies. Is that correct? And so praise the Lord for the healing of his granddaughter. And a lot of times we, we offer up prayer requests, but we don't always hear the answers to those prayers. So thanks for sharing that with us, Marty. Appreciate that today. Uh, I wanted to let you know where Pastor Jerry and Pastor Brian are today. Ray, they left us all by ourselves this week. And uh, actually, Pastor Jerry and, and Robin uh Uh, flew off yesterday morning to England and I don't know if all of you knew that he was heading to England he's going to be there for two weeks and uh, he and he and Robin and he's going to be studying the life and and journeys of John Wesley over there and so pray for him and Robin and their safety Uh, and just that it be a time of refreshment and renewal for Pastor Jerry this is a a two-week intensive study as a part of his doctoral program and uh, so that's why he's over there in England and then Pastor Brian left yesterday morning about 10 30 with a group of students for a mission trip to uh, Cleveland area working with what's called world changers are going to be uh, doing some painting and re- renovation stuff on houses and uh, hopefully sharing the love of christ with a lot of people and so you pray for pastor brian and pastor jerry as they're away from us for uh, a couple of weeks here and uh, so wanted to just give you an update on that if anybody has any questions about the cowbell that, that i was playing in the come up and see me afterwards I'll give you the I'll give you the the down low on that it was kind of a fun thing uh, to do but it was great to get to share with the kids this week and so many of them responded to the message of the, of the gospel um, I think they had over 80 80 decisions for Christ uh, this week and so it was just a special special thing for them this week they, they raised two thousand uh, dollars for the Bountiful Backpacks ministry and uh, a few hundred cans of goods uh, that are going to be used in the backpack ministry and they're going to be able to reach just a ton of kids through that so it was just a wonderful week and so let's go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, begin our time together Father we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given to us we thank you for an alive and active church that's wanting to reach out to the community here and especially this past week through VBS Lord what a blessing it is to be able to spend time with all of these children and Father just to be able to uh, infuse them with the gospel message Father we know that not all of them will be able to fully grasp what that is but Father may seeds have been planted all over this building this past week and Father we thank you for those who have worked so hard to make that happen Father thank you for a congregation who supports that with their finances and their time Father we want to lift up Pastor Jerry and Pastor Brian to you as they're traveling we pray that you would just bless and encourage them keep everyone that's traveling safe we pray a hedge of protection around them Father I pray that your work and your will would be done in their lives while they're away. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for an opportunity to spend some time talking about it today. Father, I don't want to say anything that you don't want me to say, and I only want to say the things that you want me to say, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct every thought that comes into my mind and every word that comes out of our mouth. And Father, we want to give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Speaking of VBS, if we have any visitors with us today, maybe you sent your child to VBS this week at our church and you're stopping by to check us out. We're so glad that you're here. And you saw on the update, there's uh, yellow slips of paper in the pew pockets. If you'd like to fill one of those out and take it to the information center in the foyer, we have a little gift for you and some more information about our church. And we're just so glad uh, that you're here with us today. Well, you might have looked at the title of the sermon today and saw that word change. And we're very resistant to change, aren't we? I mean, if we're going to be honest, we're very resistant to change. As a matter of fact, you've probably heard it said before that change is the only thing that stays the same. You've probably heard that adage before. And it's something that, that we, in general, are, are so resistant to. And I wonder why. 
I wonder why we're so resistant to change because if we really think about it, and in, in, especially in uh, Romans 12, 2 that Cheryl read for us just a minute ago, we often desire the will of God, but we don't want to change. But when the will of God is played out in our lives, it's going to require us to change. And so there's an interesting dynamic here in this verse. And I got to thinking about this, uh, this whole f- resistance to change. And sometimes there's good change. We, we've seen some good change before. Uh, for instance, there's this, uh, this old boy from the backwoods of uh, Tennessee. Found himself in the big city for the first time. And uh, he was standing in a building in front of the, an elevator. And this, this old uh, hobbled woman walked in there, old haggard woman walked in, and the doors closed. And a couple minutes later, the doors opened back up, and this beautiful young lady emerged from the elevator. And he couldn't believe, he couldn't believe what he saw. And he said, son, go get mama. So... <laughs> Sometimes changes uh, That doesn't work with elevators by the way I've tried that I look the same on both sides uh, Of the elevator there But no sometimes change can be Can be good in our lives But, but for, the, for generally we, we resist change that's, that's just kind of how we're built For some reason And uh, I want to share with you this morning That we can't have it both ways Not wanting change But desiring to see the will of God Manifested in our lives And so we're going to have A two part series this week And next week Talking about spiritual transformation And this week We're going to look at the focus Of spiritual transformation In Romans chapter 12 Verses 1 and 2 And next week We're going to be in the the Fifth chapter of Isaiah And we're going to be taking a look at uh, I, I'm sorry, the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And we're going to be taking a look at the process of change. So I want to encourage you to stick with me here over these next couple of weeks. Before we get started in our passage today, I want to do a little reset with you because I believe in this process of transformation, the spiritual transformation. I believe that's the goal of the Christian life is to transform into the likeness of, of the Son of God. And I want to encourage you to lay aside those things that might be running around in your mind right now and and allow the word of God to penetrate you today. Because Hebrews 4.12 says this, and hopefully this is a reminder for you, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And I hope that when you come to East Richland Friends Church, you come here partially because you're not judged. We don't want to be a church that judges. That's not uh, on us to pass judgment upon anyone. But the word of God, according to this, word, according to this verse, will judge us. And I want to, I want to encourage you to be, to be courageous enough to be judged today. Not by me, not by the person sitting next to you, but by the word of God because it is that powerful. I believe that if we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that he wants to do in our lives, we can know true transformation, that transformation that you and I so desperately need. I find it interesting that of all the people the Holy Spirit could have inspired to write words about transformation, he chose Paul. What a wonderful example of transformation. Radical change in the life of Paul. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 9, uh, verses 3 and 4 to begin with here. He used to be called Saul, and as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Down in verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, he's talking about Saul, is my chosen instrument to proclaim the name of the... My name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And down in verse 19, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And the interesting thing about Paul is that he was so zealous prior to this experience on the road to Damascus for persecuting and killing Christians, the very ones who believe in the thing that he eventually would proclaim with his own lips. If that is not an example of radical transformation in the life of somebody, I don't know what is. And so the Holy Spirit inspired this man through that experience to talk about transformation in our lives. If you'd like to follow along and you didn't bring your Bible today, we do have some in the pew pockets. You'll find this passage on either page 789 in those Bibles or on page 1137. Page 789 or 1137 if you'd like to follow along in a paper Bible this morning. Well, first of all, we see in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 2, conformity with the world is to be rejected. Conformity with the world is to be rejected. Paul says that in no uncertain terms here. And why? Why would we not want to be conformed to this world? Because it's full of sin. 
It's no more complicated than that. The Bible tells us that we, you and I, we all were born into this world in sin. And until a time of transformation in your life and my life, we continue in this world in sin. And Paul says we are not to conform to the patterns of this world. Matter of fact, Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6 say this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You see, sin in the world is causing the wrath of God to come eventually someday. And we are not to conform to the world that is the object of the wrath of God. It's very serious. But what exactly is Paul talking about here? And you'll notice in your notes today, I've given you a couple of opportunities to write down definitions of some of the words that we're talking about in verse two of Romans chapter 12. And the first definition that I wanna give you is this, is this definition for the word conform. Conform means to be after the fashion of or to have union with. To be after the fashion of or to have union with. Now, that breaks it down a little bit more deeply for us when he talks about us not conforming to the, wor- to the world. The word for conform in this comes from the Greek word schema, which is actually where we get our word scheme. You see, he's talking about us not, not conforming to the schemes of the world. It looks like this. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. And here in verse 31, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. And why? For the world in its present form is passing away. You see, anything that we sink our claws into in our conforming to the world is not gonna last I know that's not a new concept to you, but it should be a great reminder for us today. Anything that we think of in the world will not last. 1 Peter 1.14 says this, as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Do not conform to those evil desires, those natural earthly evil desires. And he says, do not be conformed to the world. What's he talking about here with this word World. It is, a, it is talking about an age. It has the idea of the times. We are not to conform with the times of our age. It could be said like this. Do not take this age as your fashion plate. That's another way of saying this. And if you know me, you know I don't like to beat around the bush when I'm up here. I'm gonna ask you this question. In what ways is your life conforming to the world right now? He tells us that we're not to, but I wonder if there are any ways in your life, in my life, where we are conforming to the world. What about possessions? What about the the music of the world? What about the entertainment of the world? Are these difficulties for you? Paul says we are not to conform to these things. And these are very important in our lives to make sure that we, that we know where we stand with those things of the world. But I, I challenge you this morning that Paul has a deeper meaning here. And it means this, conformity to the philosophy of this age, the beliefs, the values, the systems of a world that is under the influence of the evil one. You see, Paul is not just talking about those external things. He is talking about where have you bought into the philosophy of this age? We see this throughout scripture, throughout history. Times when people have bought in to the philosophy or a belief or a teaching of one man or one woman who is completely against God and many, many people follow them because they bought into that earthly philosophy. Is there a facet of your life where you have bought into an earthly philosophy, an earthly strategy, an earthly system? That is exactly what Paul is telling us to to not conform to. You know, my concern sometimes is that we take this verse in in John 17, 16, where, where Jesus is praying too lightly, and he says this, that we are not of the world. Have you ever heard it said before, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of it? I think all of us in here would agree with that. But I think we say that on one side of our mouth oftentimes. And if we look at our lives in different facets of it, there are some things in our lives that are of the world. And my challenge to you on this point is, is there anything in your life that is of the world? Are you buying into any of the systems or philosophies of this world? Paul is saying, do not conform to that. 
Those are not things that we should be following. The world, that which Paul is warning us not to be like, and this, this really scares me when I say this, the world has a tendency to change us. We are the ones that are supposed to be light in the world, changing the world for Christ, but oftentimes for Christians, the world has a tendency to change us to mold us to its, to its fashion. And that is exactly why James says in chapter one, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress, and here it is, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Folks, you consider yourself to be religious today, whatever that means for you. Paul, uh, James just gives us a definition of it and part of that definition is that we stay unspotted from the world. This is a big deal for us and, and Paul takes us to another level and he tells us what to do with this. He says in this verse that radical transformation is the antidote to conformity with the world. Radical transformation is the antidote to conformity with the world. With the world. He uses this phrase, be transformed. That's actually a sentence, a two word sentence. It's very short. And yet, with these two words, he describes with an uncanny simplicity the work of Christ in our lives that we are to be transformed. What an amazing thing! A life lived in communion with Christ will bring about radical transformation. But what does this word transform mean? Transform means to change with the indication of accompaniment. In this setting, transform means to change with the indication of accompaniment. Did you realize that change in your life, transformation in your life requires movement? It requires movement. And we're going to discover here more about this in just a minute. But first of all, it requires movement in our life. You're probably very familiar, many of you, with 2 Corinthians 5.17, but it's such a simple way to explain such a radical change. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. That is radical transformation. And if you're sitting here this morning and you've given your life to Jesus Christ and committed to him as him being the Lord of your life and asked for the forgiveness of your sins from him and accepted his free gift of salvation, you have, Ephesians tells us, been brought from death into life. You have already had a radical change happen in your life as a result of that. And Paul is encouraging us in our walk with the Lord to continue that transformation. This change. You and I cannot genuinely know Christ without a change taking place in us. Did you catch that? We cannot genuinely know Christ without a change taking place in us. And this is going to be the basis of what we talk about next week, so I want you to come back and uh, stay tuned for that. As we talk about transformation, I just want to share with you that we here at Friends Church believe in the one and only God, creator of heaven and earth. And would you agree with me this morning that he is a creative creator? I mean, just look at to your left and to your right. He's pretty creative. And I'm convinced that there's nothing in God's creation that is meaningless or without purpose. And I want to take a look for just a brief moment at one of the creatures that God created who goes through a transformation, and that's the butterfly. Now, I know everybody in here probably in their science, uh, school, uh, science classes in junior high learned about the butterfly transformation. But I want to share with you some interesting things that I found out about this, and perhaps maybe it'll help us think a little bit more about transformation in a different way. There's four stages to the transformation of a butterfly, and it starts off as an egg. The adult female butterfly lays an egg on a very specific variety of plant for that species of butterfly. Did you know that? Butterflies are picky about what they eat. And the, the butterflies will lay eggs on a very specific plant that will be the most nourishing, and they only lay a few eggs per plant so that each egg will have ample supply of nourishment. And then, as that caterpillar grows, it goes through growth process and molting, and growth and molting and growth and molting, until it finally comes to a point of, of creating a chrysalis. You've heard of that before. Um, in my reading, it's technically not a cocoon, it's a chrysalis. And in that chrysalis, an incredible transformation happens to that caterpillar, and, and you all know what that is. You've seen the butterfly, it's on our slide today, emerging from that chrysalis. It went in 
a hairy little worm and it came out a beautiful butterfly. And there are some spiritual implications of this transformation that happens in the, in the butterfly. And I want to encourage you to think back to the time that you gave your life to Christ. If that's something that you've done today, if you're here today and you've done that, think back to the time that you gave your life to Christ. Do you remember being hungry to find out more about him? I hope whoever led you to Christ either gave you a Bible or encouraged you to get into a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that could help you along this discipleship journey. A hunger for the things of God and the very specific diet was the Bible. And the more you read about the Bible, the more you wanted to know about him. And the more you read about the Bible, the more you grew. And the more you grew, the more you went through difficult times like molting. And you came out of those times and you went into other times and you came out of those times knowing that God was with you all along that time, working and transforming you. But folks, I want to encourage you with this today. The process of transformation should be happening continually in your life and in my life. And there will be one day that the Bible tells us that we will stand before God and we will emerge in our glorified bodies as those beautiful butterflies that we see coming out of the chrysalis. As a matter of fact, here's what it looks like. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 say this. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. It says that we will be like him one day because we will see him as he is. Aren't you excited for that day to come? That day when we will, we will all complete our transformation into the likeness of his son, Jesus, when we are glorified and stand in his presence. Folks, that's what we have to look forward to with transformation. Are you sitting here today and do you claim to know Christ today? I'm not talking about knowing about him. I'm talking about knowing him personally. Do you have a relationship with him? And if you claim to have a relationship with Christ, show me the change in your life. You see, that's the test. Is there change in your life? Are you undergoing radical transformation because of this relationship with Jesus? Because of the grammar that Paul uses saying be transformed, it is something that has to be done to us. It's not something that we do to ourselves, and this is not a one-shot deal. You come to Christ, transformation happens, and it's over. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to what? Complete it, right? It is a process that we're all involved with here in this transformation, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed in, into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are being transformed into the image of his Son with an ever increasing glory. Folks, that's what this transformation looks like. Why in the world would we want to resist this transformation happening in our lives? Why would I want to resist this? And yet sometimes we do, which is why we need to hear, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Paul now gives us the vehicle of this radical transformation. And that vehicle is the mind. The vehicle of this radical transformation is the mind. And the, the term that he uses here for mind, it simply means the intellect, the thought process. And so when he says this transformation needs to happen, this is, a, this is a, a qualitative change that happens in our minds. Every behavior that we exhibit happens first in our minds. Did you know that? You may remember I've shared this with you before, that we come across some piece of knowledge that comes into our minds. And as we process that knowledge, we, we attach ourselves to it and we believe it. We develop a belief about something that we know. And we begin to develop feelings about that which we believe in. And unfortunately, we're emotional creatures. And those feelings dictate our behavior. And so here's the deal. If you're sitting here this morning and you know that you have some behaviors in your life that are not pleasing and honoring to God, the transformation needs to happen where? Not in your behavior, but in your mind. And Paul knew that. He knew that if the correction took place in our minds, that that will eventually filter down into our behaviors. 
It's as simple as that, folks. And so Paul says the transformation needs to happen in your mind. Albert Barnes says it this way. All external changes, if the mind was not changed, would be useless or would be hypocrisy. Christianity seeks to reign in the soul and having a seat there, the external conduct and habits will be regulated accordingly. Reigning in the soul, this transformation of the mind, external conduct, conduct and habits will be regulated accordingly. And we have behaviors in our lives that are not conforming to God's will but to the way of the world because we have bought into a lie that we've believed in our minds. And my challenge for you this morning is what lie have you bought into? What lie has Satan told you about who you are or life and godliness that has developed into a behavior in your life that's not honoring and pleasing to God? If you, if you figure out something like that in your lives, recognize that the change needs to take place in your mind. You need to correct whatever that lie is that you've been believing. Here's what the Council of Scripture has to say about the mind. Luke 10, 27 says this. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 8, 6. The mind is governed by I'm sorry, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Do you see the transformation right there in that verse? Your mind used to be governed by the flesh, and now through a, the, the transforming work of the, a relationship with Christ, it is now governed by the Holy Spirit, and that brings life and peace. Hebrews 8.10 says this, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be, and they will be my people. You see, folks, because of the garbage that, that clutters up our minds in relation to things of the world, Paul specifically says that renewal is needed in our minds. But what does this renewal mean? Renewal is a renovation which makes a person different than in the past. Renewal is a renovation which makes a person different than in the past. The result of a mind renewal is that I am different than I was before. That's the result of this. I act differently, I think differently. Thomas Akempis, in his classic work, The Imitation of Christ, and, and I bet a lot of you have read that out here, says this about mind renewal. He, therefore, that will fully and with true wisdom understand, did you catch that? Understand the words of Christ. Let him strive to conform his whole life to that mind of Christ. I want to read that for you one more time so you really understand it here. He, therefore, that will fully and with true wisdom understand the words of Christ, let him strive to conform his whole life to that mind of Christ. You see, as our minds transform by the work of the Holy Spirit, we begin to think Christ's thoughts after him. Our mind begins to move in the direction of what God thinks, of what Christ thinks. And I tell you, folks, that is a wonderful result of a transformation of our minds. You see, Thomas Akempis realized that conformity to the things of Christ will only come through a mind that is patterned after him. But the challenge is given to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul writes this, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Do you remember when you were blind? I shared a verse with you earlier that says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every single one of us were born into this world blind. And praise God that many of us sitting here today are blind no longer. But the God of this world has blinded the minds of men, the eyes of men, that they would not understand the things of God. And you remember that time when you gave your life to Jesus and all of a sudden, the veil was moved away. You were no longer blind and you could see with clarity. Folks, that was a transformation of your minds. And that process needs to continue as we walk this walk that we call the Christian life. Our minds in the corruption and the influence of the world don't have clarity sometimes for living a healthy life. Things could get cloudy in there because of the world's influence. For example, there was a, 
uh, a visitor uh, to a, a mental institution, and he, he was talking to the director, and he, and he asked the director, how do you determine who should be admitted into your hospital or not? And the director said, well, we have what we call the, bath, the bathtub test. And so we take a bathtub and we fill it with water, and then we bring the, the potential patient in, and we give him a, a teaspoon, uh, a teacup, and a bucket, and we ask him to empty the water out of the tub. And as the visitor was listening, he kind of was putting two and two together, and he said, oh, I see. So a normal person would, would take the bucket and use it to empty out the bathtub. And the director said, no, a normal person would pull the drain plug. Would you like a bed by the window? You see, sometimes, and I know that's a silly example, but sometimes we don't process life clearly. And because of the influence of the world, how many things in our spiritual life do we not process clearly? Just as this man did not process the bathtub test clearly. But this is a great example of sometimes how we just, our minds get, get muddled up with clutter. Well, moving on in this verse two, we see that the result of this radical transformation is discerning God's will. The result of this radical transformation is discerning God's will. And my fear this morning is that too many of us, and the finger's pointing here too, too many of us focus on the second part of this verse, not so much on the first part. Are you following me with this? We want to know what God's will is for our life. Whom should I marry? How many kids should I have? Where should I live? What kind of job should I take? Do you realize what you're asking for there is God's specific will? And I'm going to challenge you this morning that who, how do you think you can have discernment for the specific will of God if you are not living in the general will of God? Listen to this. The clarity that we all desire in our lives for the specific will of God is governed by the renewing of our minds as it comes to the general will of God. Listen to this. David recognized this when he wrote that penitent psalm, Psalm 51. After he was approached by Nathan the prophet about his sin with Bathsheba, which resulted in an illegitimate child and the death of an innocent man, David was realizing as he wrote this psalm with a penitent heart that he needed this in verse 10. He said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You see, David realized that things had gotten away from him. The pull of the world had taken him away from the behaviors that were honoring and glorifying to God, and he knew that he needed a renewal, and he asked for that to be created in him and renewing of a steadfast spirit within him. Well, what is the will of God? First of all, in the setting, the word will is the expression of pleasure toward that which is liked. I bet you didn't expect that definition of will. I didn't either. When I looked this up, I had to read it again. I thought, is that the expression of pleasure toward that which is liked? Did you know? Did you know that God takes pleasure in you? Did you know God likes you? Maybe you didn't come this morning for any other reason except that you needed to be reminded that God takes pleasure in you. And I can prove it with his word. Listen to these verses. Genesis 127 says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You and I are created in God's image. He takes pleasure in you. Jeremiah 1.5, as, as he speaks to Jeremiah, he says this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Before Jeremiah was born, God had a purpose for his life. Psalm 139 tells us the same thing about us. He says, I formed you in your mother's room, and your days were laid out, be your days were laid out for you before there was yet one of them. And if you're sitting here today and you think that there is no purpose for your life, I challenge you with these verses on that. 1 Peter 2.9 but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Did you realize that you are God's special possession? That means he delights in you. You are important to him. And you might be here today thinking, how can God care? How can God take pleasure in someone like me? Dave, you don't know what I've done. I have done something so bad that there's no way that God can have any pleasure in my life. Is that you here this morning? 
Well, I want you to take the verses that I just read to you, plus many, many more, and fight that lie that you have bought into that has penetrated your mind and come out the bottom in behaviors that are not pleasing to the Lord. God takes pleasure in you. His will is about doing for you what is always the best for you. Now, see, we buck against that sometimes. How can this difficult circumstance in my life be the best for me? Well, I guarantee you that there's nowhere in Scripture that says that God just messes with us and that God leaves us for a time and then comes back to see how we're doing. No, God is with you in the midst of that difficult circumstance. That's part of the transformation process, the growing and molting and growing and molting. And God is always there in the midst of us performing his will in your life. And so what is God's general will? If I'm gonna talk about it, I wanna show you what it is. 1 Timothy 2, verses three and four say this. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God's will is that everyone will come to know him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do you find yourself not having clarity in God's specific will for your life, and yet you never thank him for anything? God's will is that we are a thankful people. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says this, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, and he goes on and on. God's will is that you and I were to be sanctified, that we're to be set apart, that we should look other than the world. That's God's will for your life. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, it says this, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing what? His will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, folks, Paul says not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we might be able to prove and test what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. And God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is for you and I to be thankful, for us to be sanctified, and for us to be used in his service to proclaim the gospel message to those around us. That's God's general will for our lives. And I guarantee you, and I want you to, I, I, hold me to this. If you don't find yourself understanding more of God's specific will in your life because you're focusing on his general will, you come and tell me. But I guarantee you, if you focus on what God's general will is for your life, you'll have clarity in those specific areas of your life. And I encourage you with that this morning. I want to remind you again that God's will is always for our good. But none of this in verse two happens without what Cheryl read in verse one. You see, transformation takes a commitment on our part. And I'm gonna read that verse for you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You see, living a life of transformation in the hands of God is gonna cost you something. And people today don't like to hear that. But that's what the word of God says, that it is gonna cost you something, and I guarantee you, that it is far greater and beyond anything that it could ever cost you. Because Jesus Christ paid the price that you and I could not pay for ourselves, the ultimate cost, that we might have an opportunity to go through the process of transformation. What a wonderful, what a wonderful reality that is. And so if you're sitting here today and you've known Jesus as your personal savior, not just known about him, but you've given your life to him, and you recognize that, man, I, I just don't have clarity in my life. I seem to be falling behind. God's knocking on the door today saying, it's time for a renewal of your mind because I want to continue this work of transformation that I started. And if you're here today and you can say, Dave, transformation hasn't begun in my life because I have never surrendered it to Christ. Let this be the day that you begin that radical transformation. And I hope I hope that we're a church full of victims of change in our lives. That change has been applied to our lives through and through. That we might be a light to the hurting world that we're not supposed to conform to. Let's stand.